Hi, everyone. I'm here to introduce Dr. Ira Helfan, who is currently serving as the co-president of the Global Federation International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And he's also co-founder and past president of Physicians for Social Responsibility, uh, the, the American chapter of the subsidiary organization. Uh, IPPNW won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985 for their work pursuing global disarmament. Dr. Helfen has spoken widely on the medical effects of nuclear war in the United States, the former Soviet Union, India, Pakistan, and France. He is co-author of a study, Accidental Nuclear War, a post-Cold War assessment which appeared in the New England, New England Journal of Medicine, and of PSR's 2006 report, The U.S. Uh, and Nuclear Terrorism, Still Dangerously Unprepared, and PSR's report, Two Billion at Risk. Dr. Helfen graduated from Harvard College and Albert Einstein College of Medicine, before becoming a Family Care Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts, Dr. Helfan worked in the ER at Mercy Hospital and the Montessori Hospital uh, Medical Center. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Helfan. Well, thank you, and thank you all for coming out today. It's, it's not a particularly pretty day, but even so, I, I suspect that you could have had a nicer time than I'm about to give you. Um, the stuff that I need to talk about is, is very difficult, and, uh, and I do appreciate you taking the time to listen to it, because it's also very important that we pay attention to this. Um, you know, a generation ago in the 1980s, maybe that's two generations, um, millions of people around the world understood how dangerous nuclear weapons were and what an incredible threat they posed to human health, to the existence of human civilization. And unfortunately, when the Cold War ended, that knowledge largely vanished from the world. I mean, there's large numbers of people who've come of age since the end of the Cold War who never lived through that terribly difficult time, never learned about these weapons. And there are lots of people my age who, who did know about this back in the 80s, but have forgotten and actually actively pushed this information out of their minds because it's really unpleasant to think about, and no one likes to do that. The result, unfortunately, is that we now have a very dangerous situation because when the Cold War ended, the weapons didn't go away. Uh, there are still 15,300 of them in the world, the vast majority, about 95% in the arsenals of the United States and Russia. But to a very significant degree, we are not attending to this problem. We're just not dealing with it. And that is an extremely difficult and dangerous situation. Let me start by sort of just reviewing what the major nuclear dangers are. Uh, and I think there are three of them. Uh, the first is the danger, potential danger of nuclear terrorism. Uh, to the extent that people pay any attention to the nuclear problem at all today, this is what they focus on. Uh, and uh, it's a legitimate concern. Uh, we did a study in, in the British Medical Journal in 2002 that looked at what would happen if terrorists attacked New York, was the city we chose, with a relatively small Hiroshima-sized bomb, uh, small by modern standards. Uh, there have been a number of other studies looking at similar scenarios attacking other cities. They all come up with roughly the same conclusion. In our study, we assume that terrorists, uh, in order to get this bomb into the United States, simply mailed it. They put it in a big crate, put it on a cargo ship, and sent it to New York, uh, and had it programmed to detonate as the ship approached the harbor. So the explosion actually took place out over the water, which tended to cut down somewhat on the destructive impact. Nonetheless, this explosion, uh, this bomb, killed about 44,000 people directly from the fire and from the explosion. Another 10,000 people from the radiation emanating directly from the explosion at the moment of detonation. And it exposed about a million and a half people downwind across Manhattan and Queens and Long Island, about a million and a half people to radioactive fallout. And of these, about 250 to 300,000 people were exposed to lethal doses of radioactive fallout if they were not promptly evacuated or uh, provided shelter. And we have no plans in New York or any other American city to evacuate people or shelter them in the event of a nuclear attack of this magnitude. And so this relatively small bomb uh, detonating out over the water uh, before it even got into New York uh, would take out about uh, 300,000 people. This is a picture of Hiroshima after the bombing there. And this is sort of what a big section of New York would look like after a terrorist bomb there. Um, the economic and social impact of this terrorist attack are really enormous and very hard to calculate. Um, you all remember, I'm sure, the way the whole economy 
shut down after September 11th, um, it would be much greater in impact uh, following an event of this type. Uh, there's been one study done about 15 years ago by the APT group down in Boston, which looked at a similar scenario where a terrorist bomb goes off across the river in the Jersey section of the Port of New York. They calculated that the damage from that would be about a trillion dollars. Uh, in our study, where the explosion actually takes out some of the extremely extensive, expensive real estate in Manhattan, the direct effect is going to be even higher than that. But the biggest impact isn't going to be the destruction in New York. It's going to be what this does to the world's economy. I mean, Wall Street shuts down. Stock markets around the world collapse. International commerce collapses. After September 11th, people didn't fly in airplanes for months. After an event like this, cargo ships would not be allowed into major ports for months. Um, the impact would be staggering. The social and political impact would be no less serious. I mean, in the event of, of an episode like this, uh, with a threat that there could be further terrorist attacks, I think civil liberties would simply go out the window. Uh, no one uh, would complain about anything the government did that it said it needed to do to protect us from another nuclear attack. And there's a wonderful short video that I saw that for the first time on Saturday. It was made by uh, the Perry Project, which is run by uh, William Perry, the former uh, Secretary of Defense under President Clinton, who is now dedicated the rest of his life to campaigning against nuclear weapons. It's available on the website of his group, The Perry Project, and it, it's really worth watching. It's very short. It just does a beautiful job of conveying not what happens when the bomb goes off, but what happens afterwards to America. So this is an incredible event, and it's something that could happen. But we have to understand, this is the least of the dangers that we face from nuclear weapons. Um, let me go up a, a step on the scale. The next thing that we need to consider is the possibility of a limited nuclear war. Uh, in the past, attention tended to focus on war between the United States and the Soviet Union, now Russia. But they're not the only nuclear powers in the world. And it is very possible that there could be a conflict between some of the smaller nuclear weapon states. And attention is focused particularly on the possibility of war in South Asia between India and Pakistan. These countries have gone to war three times since independence in the 40s. Uh, they are both nuclear weapon states. They each have about 100 to 120 nuclear uh, bombs. Uh, during the period since they have developed their nuclear arsenals, they have come close to war twice after uh, incidents between them. And there is fighting almost every day on the line of demarcation between their forces in Kashmir. Um, I think people who follow the situation there would not be at all surprised to wake up tomorrow to renewed fighting on a larger scale between India and Pakistan, or perhaps to a terrorist attack emanating from Pakistan against India, which is what triggered the last two near conflicts between them, or simply perhaps to a violent change of government in Pakistan, which has experienced many of these, uh, and which might lead to fear on the Indian part that, that the Pakistani nuclear arsenal was going to get into the wrong hands uh, and lead them to initiate uh, conventional warfare. The problem is that any conflict that takes place in South Asia uh, between India and Pakistan is almost certain to go nuclear. Uh, the Pakistani military is much smaller than the Indian. Uh, Pakistan understands that in the event of a conventional war, they will lose. And they have, in response to that, uh, elaborated a nuclear doctrine which specifically envisions the early use of nuclear weapons against invading Indian forces uh, in the hope that this would cause the war to end. Uh, from our experience with Cold War war games, whenever nuclear weapons were ever used in a war game between the United States and the Soviet Union, the war didn't end. The war escalated to a larger nuclear war. And that is probably what would happen in South Asia as well. So given this situation, we have looked at uh, a particular scenario. It's a relatively conservative one. We assume that India and Pakistan each use about half of their arsenal against targets in urban areas in the other countries about 100 warheads altogether. Each, we, in our scenario, we assume are just the size of the Hiroshima bomb. In fact, there are many weapons in both arsenals that are two to three times larger than this. But again, it, it, we were trying not to give a worst case scenario, but just a possible scenario. Um, the consequences in, directly in South Asia are, are horrifying. 20 to 30 million people dead in the first week from the explosions, the fires, and the local radiation. 
And to put that into context, during all of World War II, across the entire planet, 50 million people died. But that was over eight years. And this would be a similar number of people dying in a single week in these two countries. But as horrifying as these local effects are, they are not the worst part of the problem. A war between India and Pakistan using 100 Hiroshima-sized bombs, the fires caused by these explosions put about 5 million tons of soot into the upper atmosphere. And they dropped temperatures across the entire planet, about 1.3 degrees centigrade, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is more than twice the rise in temperature that has taken place in the last 130 years, which so demands our attention uh, as we try to deal with global climate change. What we would see here is a change more than twice that magnitude taking place over the course of about three days. And as a result of this, there would be a shortening of the growing season in many of the most important food producing parts of the world. There would be declines in precipitation. Cooler air causes less water to evaporate from the ocean to fall back as precipitation. And as a result of these uh, effects, this global climate disruption, there would be a significant decline in food production worldwide. Uh, we have been able to study this primarily in the United States and China, the world's two largest food producers. Uh, I can show you lots of graphs and charts. I'm not going to do that, but just um, to give you an idea, summarizing the, the findings we've had in China, uh, in the first five years, uh, Chinese corn production goes down 17%. Middle season rice production goes down 20%. And winter wheat, which is the second largest crop in China for food consumption, goes down 39%. This is over a five year period. Even over a full decade, you can see the numbers just to the right on that graph. Uh, winter wheat is still down 31%, averaged over the entire decade. Um, the world is not in a position to absorb this kind of decline in food production. At the current moment, um, there are very inadequate grain reserves uh, total world global reserves amount to about 80 days of consumption. That means it's enough food stored on the planet to feed the people of the Earth for about two and a half months. Uh, and this famine will last for 10 years. And that means that this food reserve is simply inadequate to what needs to be done. In addition, we are very vulnerable at this point. There are about 795 million people around the world who are malnourished today. They get 1,800 calories on average, which is just enough for an average sized adult to maintain his or her body mass and do a little bit of work to gather food or to grow food. All of these people would be at risk in the event of a limited nuclear war and a resulting global famine. In addition, there are 300 million people who live in countries today where nutrition is quite good. Um, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Malaysia, most of the countries in the Middle East and North Africa but countries where much of the food is imported. And the event of a nuclear war and the and an ensuing uh, nuclear famine, there would be no food imports available to these countries. The countries which export food would start hoarding. They would hold on to their food uh, to feed their own people. And so these 300 million people would also be at risk. And finally, there are about a billion people in China who have not shared in the economic progress that China has seen over the last three decades. They're getting adequate food today, but they're quite poor. And as food prices in China soared, as they would throughout the world, these people also would be at risk. And this has led us to conclude that worldwide, perhaps 2 billion people would be at risk of starvation as a result of this limited regional nuclear war taking place in one corner of the globe and involving less than 0.5% of the world's nuclear weapons. These findings have enormous implications for nuclear policy in South Asia and also for the policy of the rest of the world as it relates to South Asia. But it is important to understand that this nuclear famine scenario is not something which is geographically dependent on the location in South Asia. A war, same number of warheads, any place on the planet would have the same effect. And in that context, it is important for us to understand that the United States has tried in submarines each one of which has not 100, but 96 warheads. And each of these warheads are 10 to 30 times larger than the bombs we used in our scenario. That means that each US Trident submarine can create this nuclear famine disaster many times over. And we have 14 of them. And that's only a third of our nuclear arsenal, because we also have ground-based missiles 
and bombers which launch cruise missiles and gravity bombs. And the Russian arsenal has the same, literally insane level of overkill capacity. So let's consider for a minute what these weapons would do, the arsenals of the major powers. Now, for 25 years, since the end of the Cold War, we have been told we do not need to worry about this, that the US and Russia are no longer enemies, and war between them is simply not going to happen. Uh, at a meeting at the State Department as recently as September of 2014, the Under Secretary of State for uh, Disarmament told me, we do not consider the possibility of nuclear war between states. We're only concerned about terrorism. Well, the crises in Syria, and especially in Ukraine, I think have given the complete lie to these assurances. It is clear that the United States and Russia could end up on opposite sides of a conflict. And given the incredible nuclear saber rattling that has taken place on both sides since the Ukraine crisis erupted, it is also clear that a war between the United States and Russia could escalate to the use of nuclear weapons. So let's consider what would happen if those weapons were used. I want to start by describing what a large-scale attack on a modern city would look like. Uh, we saw the image of Hiroshima. That's not what's going to happen. That was one small bomb. A major American city like New York would be targeted not with one Hiroshima-sized bomb, but with something like 10 to 15, maybe 20 bombs, each of which would be, in the Russian arsenal, we're talking 30 to 80 times larger than the Hiroshima-sized bomb. Uh, it's very hard to describe 15 explosions going off all at the same time. So I'm going to use a model of a single larger explosion, a single 20 megaton bomb. The megatonnage is actually a little bit bigger than would probably fall on New York. The destruction is actually considerably less because you do more damage if you have multiple explosions spread out over a large area. That's why uh, we've modernized our forces and got rid of our 20 megaton bombs and built lots of smaller bombs instead. But I think that this model, even though it underestimates the destruction, it is adequate to give us an understanding of what we're dealing with. Within one one thousandth of a second of the detonation of this bomb, a fireball would form, reaching out for two miles in every direction, four miles across. Within this area, the temperature would rise to 20 million degrees Fahrenheit, which is hotter than the surface of the sun. And everything would be vaporized. The buildings, the trees, the people, the upper level of the Earth itself would disappear. To a distance of four miles in every direction, the explosion would generate blast pressures of 25 pounds per square inch and winds in excess of 600 miles per hour. Mechanical forces of this magnitude destroy anything that human beings can build. Underground shelters collapse when exposed to pressures this great. To a distance of six miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that automobiles would melt. To a distance of 10 miles in every direction, and note I've had to change the scale of this map to encompass this growing circle of destruction. To a distance of 10 miles in every direction, the winds would still be greater than 200 miles per hour, the blast pressure is greater than 10 pounds per square inch. Forces of this magnitude will level masonry buildings, um, uh, wooden frame buildings like the dormitories and, and frat houses on this campus. A building like this would have the walls and the floors blown out, and all that would be left would be a steel skeleton. To a distance of 16 miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that everything flammable would burn. Paper, cloth, heating oil, wood, it all ignites. And you get hundreds of thousands of fires, which over the next half hour coalesce into a firestorm, 32 miles across, covering over 800 square miles. Within this entire area, the temperature rises to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. All of the oxygen is consumed, and every living thing dies. The bacteria and the viruses die. Everything is sterilized. In the case of New York City, we're talking about 15 million people dead in a half an hour. And if this attack were part of a war between the United States and Russia, this same level of destruction would be visited on every major city in both countries. A study which we published in 2002 showed that if only 300 of the 1,500 warheads that the Russians keep on hair trigger alert, if only 300 of those warheads got through to targets in the United States, um, 75 to 100 million people would be dead in a half an hour. <clears throat> in addition, the entire economic infrastructure of the country, everything that we depend on 
to maintain our population would be destroyed. You know, we, we do not grow our own food by and large. We are not hunter-gatherers either. We require an intact society to stay alive. And that society would be gone. There'd be no electric grid. The internet would be gone. The public health system would be gone. The food distribution system would be gone. The system for distributing uh, you know, natural gas and, and heating oil would be gone. And over the months following this attack, the vast majority of the American population that did not die in the initial wave of explosions would die from starvation, from exposure, from epidemic disease, and from radiation poisoning. But again, these direct effects are not the main problem. The main problem is the global climate disruption that follows. The small war in South Asia puts about 5 million tons of soot into the upper atmosphere. A war between the United States and Russia involving only those weapons which will be left to them when the New START Treaty is fully implemented next year. That war puts 150 million tons of soot into the upper atmosphere. And it drops temperatures across the planet, not 1.3 degrees centigrade, but about 8 degrees centigrade. In the interior regions of North America and Eurasia, the temperature drop is 25 to 30 degrees centigrade. We have not seen conditions on this planet that cold for 18,000 years since the coldest moment of the last ice age. And these conditions will last for a decade or more. During the first three years after this war, there will not be a single day free of frost in the temperate zones of the Northern Hemisphere. It means the temperature will go below freezing for at least some point every day. And under those conditions, all of the temperate ecosystems which have evolved dependent on an annual summer will collapse. All food production in the Northern Hemisphere will stop. The vast majority of the human race will starve to death. And it is possible that we will become extinct as a species. Now, this is not just a nightmare scenario that I've cooked up. This is a real and present danger. The United States and Russia today carry out military exercises with nuclear-capable forces meant to spook and scare the other side. President Putin has threatened to use nuclear weapons if the uh, conflict in Ukraine escalates. And even if there is not a deliberate decision to use these weapons, there is a very real possibility that an accident will occur. We know of at least five occasions when either Moscow or Washington prepared to launch nuclear war, this is since 1979, in the mistaken belief that the other side had already launched an attack. And the most recent of these took place in January of 1995, well after the end of the Cold War. And on that occasion, as best we can tell, we came within five minutes of an all-out nuclear war between the United States and Russia. Given the increasing tension between these two countries, should there be a similar false alert at this point in time, there is an even greater chance that the side that be believed it was under attack would, in fact, initiate nuclear warfare. And to just add one more level to the danger that we face, James Cartwright, former commander of strategic forces in the United States, has been speaking for the last six months about what he sees as the greatest danger of all, which is that terrorists would not bring a bomb into New York Harbor, but would do a cyber attack on either a Russian or a US command and control facility and actually launch one or more Russian or US missiles at the other side thereby triggering a nuclear war. This is something which he believes is theoretically possible and which he believes terrorists are almost certainly working to achieve the, the uh, operative cap capacity to, to carry out. So this is the danger that we face. And um, this is, if you haven't thought about this, I'm sorry to give you one more thing to worry about. But we have to deal with this. Why am I talking about it? Well, because this is the future that is going to be if we don't take action. It's as simple as that. We are marching towards this future at breakneck speed at this point, given the, over the last two years. But more importantly, this is not the future that has to be. Nuclear weapons are not some force of nature. They're not an asteroid coming at us from, from outer space. They're not an act of God. They're things that we have built with our own hands, and we know how to take them apart. The only thing that's been missing, been lacking, for the last several years, since the end of the Cold War, has been the political will to do that. And that's where we come in, because we need to recreate that understanding of the danger that we face and that political will to do something about it. And fortunately, there have been some very positive developments in that regard over the last few years. 
um, starting with the publication of the first nuclear famine studies in, in 2007 and 2008 and 2009, many countries in the global south became very concerned about nuclear war again. Uh, all the countries in Africa and Latin America are in nuclear weapons-free zones. They thought they had gotten themselves out of this predicament. They thought they didn't need to worry about nuclear war anymore. And they suddenly realized they still did. And while we may think that nuclear war would never happen, we living in the United States, people living in countries where our military has often carried out new, uh, military activity tend to be much less sanguine about the good behavior of the US and Russia, and much more worried that we'll actually do something stupid. In 2010, the International Committee of the Red Cross entered the issue. They've always had a position calling for the abolition of nuclear weapons, but they decided that year to make this a major focus of their work. And around the world, the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement has been carrying out a vigorous educational campaign about what they call the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons, basically the information I've been presenting today. Um, Unfortunately, the American Red Cross has made an explicit decision not to be part of this campaign. It didn't oppose the decision to launch the campaign, but it has chosen not to participate. And this has been under great pressure from the Obama administration not to participate in this activity. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, many non-nuclear weapon states around the world have decided that it is time for them to provide leadership on this issue. They have given up on the nuclear weapon states living up to their obligations under Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which requires them to negotiate a treaty to eliminate their nuclear arsenals. They've been ignoring these obligations for over 40 years. And the non-nuclear weapon states have now said it's time for them to act. Uh, they convened in three separate global, three separate governmental conferences in 2013 and 2014. The third of them in Vienna in December of 2014 was attended by 158 governments from around the world, more than three quarters of the world's countries. It was a two-day meeting to examine what will happen if nuclear weapons are actually used. And it concluded, as had the two previous conferences, with the understanding that this is an unacceptable existential threat to human survival and these weapons need to be eliminated. At the end of the conference, the Austrian government issued a pledge to close the gap in international law which does not yet explicitly ban the possession of nuclear weapons. You know, there are treaties which ban the possession of chemical weapons, biological weapons, cluster bombs, landmines. All of these are defined as too inhumane to be allowed. But there is no treaty which bans the possession of nuclear weapons. And the Austrian government pledged to work to close that gap. They were partnered at that meeting by an extraordinary organization Sorry, that's a picture of the meeting in Vienna. Uh, they chose a rather grand place to hold it. Um, there, were, there was a, a civil society partner to, the, to that meeting, which is the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which is an incredibly exciting uh, umbrella campaign that's formed over the last several years. It now involves 450 NGOs in 98 countries around the world, led mainly by people in their 20s and 30s. This is a young person's movement. And this civil society uh, campaign, hearing the Austrian pledge, sort of seized on it and said, this is not the work for Austria alone to do. And they went around the world and started working with the Austrian government to get other countries to sign on to this pledge. And at this point, more than 140 governments have associated themselves with this pledge to work for a treaty banning nuclear weapons. And at the United Nations last fall, 130 plus countries voted to set up in Geneva an open-ended working group to come up with a concrete plan for closing this gap. Uh, the working group met for the first time in February. Its second session will be in May. And its final session will be in August, where they will finalize their recommendation, which they are required to report back to the General Assembly in September. It is probable that this working group will propose to the General Assembly a new treaty to ban the possession of nuclear weapons. This effort is being opposed ferociously by the United States and all the other nuclear weapon states who for all their differences, can come together on the one issue of preserving their nuclear monopoly in the world. Um, but despite their efforts, this campaign, this, this, despite their efforts, the effort of the non-nuclear weapon states is going ahead. And it is probable that the UN will set up this fall some kind of negotiating forum for this new treaty. This is a sea change in the world. 
and it is the best opportunity we have had to make real progress for nuclear disarmament since the end of the Cold War. Here in the United States, this is, there's been an almost complete press blackout about this whole initiative. Uh, and we need to work now to change that, to get information out about this, about the danger that we face and the steps being taken to address it. And we need to take advantage of the opportunity that's being created by this campaign for a ban treaty to mobilize people in this country and to put pressure on our government to do what it needs to do. We, those of us who know about this, and that includes all of you in the room right now, have an enormous responsibility. The fate of the Earth is literally sitting on your shoulders, and this is a huge burden. And for those of you who did not know about this stuff before, I sort of apologize for placing this burden on you today, especially those of you who are college age. You had nothing to do with creating this problem. And in that very important sense, you are not in any way responsible for it. But in a much more important sense, you are responsible. Because if you and me and people like us don't take action, this problem is not going to, weigh, going to go away. And all the horrible things that I have described are going to come to be. So we have a huge, huge burden, a huge responsibility. But if this is a burden, I think it is also something of a gift. Every one of us wants to do something good with our life. We have been offered the opportunity to save the world, which is a very good thing to do. And I think we need to look at, at it that way. You know, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with The Lord of the Ring. Nuclear weapons are the closest we've ever come on this planet to a ring of power. And the struggle to get rid of these weapons is every bit as desperate, but every bit as heroic and great as the task undertaken by the Fellowship of the Ring. The only difference is that that fellowship was limited you know, to a handful of hobbits and dwarves. Our fellowship requires the efforts of all of us. No one of you is expected to solve this problem by yourself. But every one of you needs to do that part of this job, which is yours to do. And you need to figure out what that task is. And I hope you will take up that task. Uh, and I think if we all get together, we can get rid of these weapons and assure that there is a future for this planet, that our children and our grandchildren get to enjoy life on this beautiful Earth. It's reported in Deuteronomy that God said, Behold, I have set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life that you and your children might live. That is literally the choice before us today. And so let's all resolve to choose wisely and to act with courage and determination so that indeed our children can live. I know this has been difficult stuff to listen to, and I really thank you very much for your attention. I thank you even more for what I'm sure you're all going to do going forward from here. Thank you. Questions and comments, please, in the back. Uh, as recently as last week, Senator Sam Nunn stated that uh, really the most, the thing he's most worried about is a dirty bomb from the terrorists. So he basically is kind of discounting exactly what you said here. And here is a man who is, you know, well known in, in you know, the anti-nuclear uh, community. How do you address that? Well, uh, Sam Nunn is very worried about a dirty bomb. He thinks there's a very high probability of this happening in the very near future. But he and the Nuclear Threat Initiative are very concerned about the possibility of nuclear war. And it's interesting, I have a meeting with them in the, in, next week. Um, they want to talk about how to merge their efforts and our efforts, or how to work collaboratively. Uh, it's probably a better way of describing that than merging the efforts. Um, they still have a very great uh, focus on preventing nuclear terrorism. But they are increasingly concerned, especially in the last two years, about the danger of nuclear war. And uh, you know, the conference, a conference that I was at uh, on Saturday at MIT, where um, Dr. Uh, former Defense Secretary William Perry spoke, uh, he also was very active with the Nuclear Threat Initiative and expressed grave concern about the danger of nuclear war. He has said uh, uh, several times publicly in the last three months that he feels the danger of nuclear war is greater now than it was in the 1980s at the height of the Cold War. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the uh, uh, possible conflict between the U.S. and Russia, and, uh, and uh, also uh, between India and Pakistan, which is well known. Uh, you don't mention ch uh, China, and uh, uh, they've been making 
uh, some fairly aggressive no uh, noises uh, in, in their area. Uh, uh, how does China uh, uh, fit into this? They, they certainly have the weapons. Yeah, I, I, it, it's only lack of time. I didn't talk about uh, the Middle East or, or North Korea either, but you're absolutely right. Um, there's, that's another dimension. You know, in, in the past, during the 80s, we really didn't worry about conflict between the United States and China. Uh, China was something of an ally of, of U.S. and NATO in, in the standoff against the Soviet Union. Um, that's changed, and there is real tension between the United States and China also. And China is, uh, uh, all nine of the nuclear weapon states are modernizing their nuclear arsenals. China is actually also enlarging their nuclear arsenal. And it, it's, it is a departure from their previous nuclear policy, which was very defensive. Uh, the Chinese were the most firm in their commitment to a no first use policy. They would only use nuclear weapons to retaliate if they were attacked. Um, they are moving away from, from such a restricted view of the role of nuclear weapons in building a large nuclear arsenal. And it is one more potential flashpoint. War between the United States and China would also be catastrophic. It would not involve the same numbers of warheads between the United States and Russia. But as we've seen, even a very limited war um, would cause you know, a, a global catastrophe. And you know, in, in one thing, point that I really didn't make that I, I should have about the, the South Asia scenario, the, the death of 2 billion people from that limited war, the potential death over a decade, that does not mean the extinction of our species. There are 7 billion of us on the planet now. But it almost certainly means the end of, of civilization as we know it. Uh, no civilization in human history has ever withstood a, a shock, anything approaching that magnitude. And it, modern industrial civilization would simply collapse in the event of even that very limited nuclear war. And that's the kind of danger that we face, a war between the United States and China, a war between India and China, which is also, they also view themselves as nuclear adversaries. Any of these conflicts would be the end of, what, of the civilization that we know. Yeah. Uh, I just have a question about what your organization's position is on the development of nuclear technology for other purposes, including energy. Um, I mean, do you just fully oppose any advancements in nuclear technology, or is it just in the usage of war? Um, I, I think nuclear power is a distinct issue from nuclear weaponry. But uh, our organization does strongly oppose nuclear power as well for several reasons. One, the health risks associated with nuclear power itself. Uh, secondly, and perhaps um, the one that would be surprising to many people, because we think uh, nuclear power, uh, uh, the investing money in nuclear power is diverting money that needs to be spent to protect us from climate change. Dollars spent in nuclear, for nuclear power could be much more efficiently spent in other ways of cutting down our, our dependence on fossil fuel. And third, and most important, is the close linkage between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. The technology is the same. The Israelis, the Indians, the Pakistanis, uh, the Ar Iranians, and the North Koreans, all of the nuclear weapons programs uh, were based on civilian nuclear reactors. And if you build a nuclear power plant, you, if you sell a nuclear power plant to a country, which the United States aggressively does, uh, even though we're not building them here, um, you give that country the ability to build nuclear weapons. The US has this kind of schizophrenic policy where we say nuclear terrorism, nuclear proliferation, rather, is the greatest threat we face. And yet, we provide the capability of, to countries to proliferate, to build nuclear weapons. So somewhat separate issue, but we're opposed to nuclear power for those reasons as well. Uh, how has US and Russian disarmament of the nuclear weapons over the past several years contributed to massive decreases in the likelihood of Well, I don't think the likelihood has decreased at all in the last few years. You know, the United States and Russia concluded the New START Treaty in 2010. Uh, which cut down the number of weapons to be deployed on each side to 1,550 uh, to be implemented fully by next year. But since then, there's been no forward movement at all uh, to, to further reduce the size of these arsenals. Uh, many of the uh, joint programs which the US and Russia had had to try to manage the nuclear danger have broken down. The Russians didn't attend last week's nuclear security summit in Washington. They boycotted it. Uh, the program that we have had uh, since the early 1990s to help the Russians dispose of their excess nuclear materials, that's been suspended. Uh, High-level contact between U.S. and Russian military, which has been quite good over the last 25 years, has been suspended. Um, and far from taking steps to further uh, reduce their arsenals, uh, all nine nuclear weapon states, including U.S. and Russia, have engaged in massive campaigns to modernize their arsenals. In the United States, we are projecting to spend about $1 trillion over the next 30 years 
to modernize every single component of our nuclear triad, the, the land-based missiles, the submarine missiles, and the bombers. We're going to have a new bomber and new bombs to go with it. We're going to have a new intercontinental ballistic missile. We're going to have a new class of submarines and new missiles to go on them, and new warheads to go on those missiles. And we're going to spend a trillion dollars doing this. Um, that plan put forward by the Obama administration, which gave us such hope initially that they were going to work for the abolition of nuclear weapons, that plan is completely incompatible with seeking a world free of nuclear weapons. It commits us to a vast nuclear arsenal for the next 60 years. And we now have a, a choice in this country. There's, there's a fundamental decision to be made. We're either going to move in that direction and commit ourselves to maintaining nuclear weapons for the next 60 or 70 years, or we're going to embrace the international movement that is now growing, calling for the abolition of these weapons. And it's amazing that with a presidential campaign going on, this most important national uh, decision isn't being talked about at all. But again, that's our job. We need to figure out how to make the politicians and the leaders start talking about this. So there was great hope as recently as 2010 that we were moving in the right direction. And that hope has largely evaporated at this point. Yeah. What makes you think that any of the conflicts you mentioned, many of which have existed for years, would ever escalate beyond conventional warfare? Well, the general tendency of militaries to use whatever weapons are at hand. The United States and Russia haven't fought directly since the beginning of the nuclear era. India and Pakistan haven't gone to war directly since they both had nuclear weapons. Uh, but were they to do that, um, there is every reason to fear that this conflict would be nuclear. In terms of U.S.-Russia relations, uh, the U.S. back in the 80s felt that it was outgunned on the ground by the Warsaw Pact. And so it had extensive plans to use nuclear weapons early on in a conflict if the Russians attacked. That situation is reversed. Now the Russians feel outgunned by NATO. And they have changed their nuclear doctrine. Uh, in the past, Russia said they had a no first use policy, which the US never did. They said they would only use nuclear weapons in retaliation for nuclear attack. That's not their doctrine anymore. They now say they will use nuclear weapons in a conflict that involves only conventional forces. And moreover, they say they will use them early in such a conflict. They have put forward a doctrine called nuclear de-escalation, which is an extremely strange term. But basically what it maintains is that in the event of, a, of an armed conflict with NATO, uh, they will use nuclear weapons early on to try to compensate for their inferiority in conventional weapons and to bring the conflict to a rapid end. Um, this is a very frightening doctrine, and it is a very unrealistic one. In the war games that have been conducted, by the US military uh, ever since the, the mid-70s, every single time a single nuclear weapon is used, the conflict escalates to full-scale nuclear war. No one seems to know how to stop in the very short time frame they're given once the genie is out of the bottle. In terms of the situation in South Asia, uh, the Indians, uh, after the terrorist attack in Mumbai in 2008, mobilized extensively for a period of weeks um, they did not attack at that point. The situation was diffused. But the doctrine that they operate under is called cold start. And it calls for a rapid uh, uh, intervention in Pakistan in the event that war breaks out with a large tank and infantry force to try to split Pakistan in half, separating the big cities, uh, Lahore and, and Rawalpindi in the north, from Karachi in the south. And the Pakistanis know that they will lose that conventional war. And so their response to that is a military doctrine that says that they will use nuclear weapons early on in such a conflict to try to stop the Indians. So I think there is, there is great reason to be fearful that these conflicts, should they happen in the future, uh, will escalate to the use of nuclear weapons. Yeah. There was a number of conflicts between like, uh, Russia and the US over Ukraine, or China, or in Pakistan, or possible dirty bombs. Out of those issues, what do you see as the, the largest likelihood out of those? And what, in the next five, 10 years, could you sound like a relative way to live that you, you believe that that, is that that could happen? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like telling a patient with cancer how much time they have left. It's very hard to be precise about this kind of stuff. There's really no uh, uh, empiric basis for doing that. But um, the situation that, that worries me the most is South Asia. Uh, I think that you know, Pakistan is a, is a profoundly unstable country. Uh, and the situation there is is unstable, and it's getting worse. Um, and it actually, part of, part of my concern there relates to climate change. 
Uh, I think there's a, there's a huge intersection between these two huge threats to human survival. And the intersection is that as the climate, as climate change progresses, uh, many conflicts are going to be uh, exacerbated because the situation on the ground is just going to get worse. Uh, as it gets hotter and drier in South Asia, uh, it's going to be harder and harder for India and Pakistan to feed their populations. And there's going to be increasing competition between them for the water, mainly in the Indus Valley, that feeds Pakistan coming out of the Himalayas in, in India. Um, and that whole situation there with its incredibly complex, you know, with economic dimensions, religious dimensions, it's going to have this climate dimension as well thrown in. And so I'm very worried about South Asia. Um, terrorist attack, the one that gets the most play, um, this is also a real possibility. I mean, we know ISIS has been looking to get nuclear capabilities. Al Qaeda has been as well. Um, and it's pretty easy to build a nuclear weapon, actually, a relatively small one, if you can get your hands on, an, on a relatively small amount of highly enriched uranium or plutonium. That's the, that's the, the step that's hard. But if you can steal that, uh, or if you can buy that, uh, it's relatively easy to build a weapon. Or alternatively, and this is part of the problem in South Asia, uh, the Pakistani military, we know that there are parts of the Pakistani military that have close links to al-Qaeda. And the possibility that a fully formed bomb could be diverted is a real fear. So the danger of terrorism is real, too. I, I'm not answering your question the way you want, I know. Um, the situation between the US and Russia, Perhaps a slightly less chance that this is going to happen, but boy, the last couple of years have been scary. I mean, this wasn't supposed to happen. We, we were supposed to be friends. Uh, this whole nonsense of, of Putin saying that he can reduce the U.S. to nuclear ash, I, I mean, that's like something Khrushchev said in the 60s. We're not supposed to be hearing this at this point in time. It's very scary. Um, somebody hasn't, and I'll come back to you. Yeah. yeah so that's a great question, because there are a number of countries that have done that. Uh, South Africa uh, is probably the, the most important. They built a nuclear arsenal, and they chose to get rid of it. Uh, at the end of the, when the Soviet Union broke up, three republics, Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan, all had large nuclear arsenals, and they turned them over to Russia. They, they denuclearized themselves. Um, complicated situations in each of these, in, of these countries that led to this. I mean, in South Africa, it was the transition to majority rule. Um, I always thought, that was my understanding of it. Uh, uh, F.W. de Klerk, the president uh, of South Africa just before Mandela, who made the decision, actually says that wasn't the reason. The reason was the fall of the Soviet Union, that they had built their nuclear arsenal uh, out of fear that Soviet proxy states in Angola and Mozambique would attack them. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, they felt they didn't face this danger. And there was this horrible Faustian bargain they had made building nuclear weapons. They thought they could get rid of it. And they, so they did. They got rid of the weapons. Um, the republics of the former Soviet Union, um, I mean, they basically just didn't want to be involved in this enterprise. Ukraine, in Ukraine, there's, there's some debate now whether that was the correct move or not. Um, getting rid of nuclear weapons in the future is going to be very much more complicated. Uh, I think it's the leadership for this is going to have to come from the United States. Um, there are nine nuclear weapon states, but the P5, the Permanent Members of the Security Council, are the major nuclear powers. They have to lead the way on this. And the only country, well, the only country that can really provide definitive leadership is the United States. The Russians aren't going to do it. China, France, and the UK, and UK have much smaller arsenals. The UK could play a critical role. Um, they could decide not to. Uh, renew their Trident option. Their Trident submarines have to be retired. And they could decide not to invest the large sum of money in building a, a new f sub fleet. That's a possibility, but it's a bit of a long shot at this point. Uh, ultimately, it, it, this is going to fall on us. The US is going to have to provide leadership. Getting some of the smallest states to give up their arsenals is going to be very difficult. Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel in particular feel that they face an existential threat from their neighbors and that nuclear weapons in some way make them secure. And we're going to have to work on addressing their security concerns to get them to give up those weapons. Uh, one of the arguments that I think will be helpful is to help the leadership in these countries understand that, in fact, these weapons really don't make them secure. These are suicide weapons in, in, in the literal sense of the word. One of the most useful conversations I've ever had was a session in the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, 
a few years ago when I was asked to uh, speak to a, um, a symposium there. It was the first time ever in the Israeli parliament that the fact that Israel has a nuclear arsenal was openly discussed. And um, one of the leaders of the pro-nuclear bloc in the parliament, a fellow named, uh, I'm going to block on his name, I'll get it in a second. Anyway, he's a leader of the Likud bloc, uh, came to the, to the session basically to tell me what an idiot I was for being so naive as to think that you know a country like Israel facing the dangers it, it faces should give up its nuclear arsenal. And so we talked a little bit about the South Asia scenario. And I pointed out to him that the Israeli arsenal is itself large enough to cause this kind of a global disaster. Even if not a single bomb fell on Israel, Israel would be destroyed by the use of its own arsenal. That was very upsetting to him. Equally upsetting was the understanding that a war between India and Pakistan, which he never thinks about, posed as existential a threat to Israel as the Iranians. And there's nothing that he could do about that except encourage them to get rid of their nuclear weapons. And it was really extraordinary. Uh, at the end of the session, in, in public, in front of a large audience, he said, I don't agree with you that we can get rid of all of our nuclear weapons, but perhaps you're right, we need to get rid of most of them. And it was like a complete, really, turnaround on his position. I think to the extent that we can get the leaders of all the nuclear weapon states to understand that far from providing security, their own nuclear weapons are the greatest threat to their own security. The extent that we can get them to understand that, it will help to facilitate this a lot. There are three messages we need to get out. Nuclear war can happen. It's going to be incredibly much worse than you ever thought. And the weapons are suicide bombs. They don't give us any, any real security. And if we can get those messages out to the public and to our leaders, that's what we need to do to, to really change things. Yeah, you had a question. Uh, I think, uh, do you propose a method to dispose of the nuclear weapons that are already being held? I understand most of them aren't usually retired. They kind of they exist for long periods of time, and finding places to put them or ways to dispose of them is incredibly difficult. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a medical doc. This is not my field particularly. But what I can say about this is we do know how to dismantle them. We, there used to be over 50,000 nuclear warheads in the world. We're down to 15,000. Uh, 35,000 of them have been dismantled. Um, the nuclear material is still there. And the storage of that for extremely long periods of time is a problem we have not solved. But we do know how to physically take the weapons apart. And um, although there's still a storage problem, obviously we're much more secure if the material is not sitting in a bomb that can go off on a missile that can be launched. So we do know how to dismantle the weapons. Yes, please. In the event of a uh, terrorist nuclear attack on the United States, do you have any insight as to what the United States response might be? Is it likely there will be a retaliation on nuclear bases? Well, you know, the, <clears throat> that's one of the, the problems. When, when people are worried about nuclear terrorism, they say that's the reason we can't get rid of our nuclear weapons. We have to be able to deter the terrorists. But if terrorists set off a nuclear bomb here, we're not going to know where it's coming from. We're not going to know who to retaliate against. We're probably going to have martial law in this country. Um, and probably some very um, undemocratic things are going to be done to many of, of, the, of the immigrants in this country who come from, from Muslim countries, because that'll be the assumption that this was an Islamic terrorist attack. But we're not going to know who to retaliate against. And so we won't. Um, and, and you know, I think that's, that's a very important truth that we need to understand. These weapons, when it comes to nuclear terrorism, provide absolutely no deterrence at all because terrorists know that we're not going to be able to trace them. We're not going to know who, who, who did it. So um, I think the main response that we're going to see, well, at the level of, of the medical response, there will be none. We know this. We've looked at this very carefully. There is no effective medical response at all that you can make just to an event like this. Uh, most of the people who are injured will die uh, before any help can be mobilized to, to get to them. Uh, some of the people who get radiation poisoning will be able to do something for them. But basically, there is no emergency medical system any place in the country that could respond to uh, an event of this magnitude. Um, the rest of it will be a political uh, and police response here in the United States, and it will not be pretty. Sir? I remember that in the 1980s, the Soviet Union attacked Quite a few people associated with um, ESR did presentations that came to be known as the bombing run. The idea was to show uh, in detail 
what would be the likely response, consequences of one large nuclear bomb exploding in the center of an American city in terms of where would the casualties be, how many would there be, what, would, what medical response would be possible for people who are wounded. It was quite devastating, this, and I think it was effective for a lot of people. I haven't seen anything like that for a long time. And I guess my question is, do you think it would be useful in the context of the strange <coughs> presidential election we're having to revive some of that sort of presentation? Well, I absolutely do. I mean, this was sort of a mini bombing run. That's how people refer to this talk that I gave today as, as the very shortened version of the bombing run. Uh, that's the term they use. Um, I think it's very important to get this information out, and that's what PSR does. We speak to any audience that will listen to us about this and try to figure out how to get this into the general media and especially now into social media. And there are a bunch of YouTube versions of this that are available. Um, it has been very difficult since the end of the Cold War to get people to pay attention. It's gotten a little bit easier in the last year or two because of the situation in Ukraine, perhaps because of some of the crazier statements coming out of people like Trump and Cruz, uh, which have, have rattled people a fair amount. But yes, this, this is what we try to do. And, and in terms of that, we're actually we're having a, a one-day symposium. Uh, the bombing runs were, were conducted as, as part of a symposium series that PSR did in every major city in the country. Um, in which we did a one or two day presentation in detail of what will happen if there's a nuclear war. Uh, we're going to be having a symposium in Boston in the fall uh, about climate change and nuclear war, trying to draw that link out in detail. And it is our hope that if that goes well, we will turn that into the same kind of national symposium series and try to take this show on the road and do major symposia all around the country. But in the meantime, we've got a bunch of speakers who go out and give presentations like this. Uh, describe what will happen to a city if a large bomb goes off. Not in quite the detail that we did in a one-day conference, but uh, I think with enough detail to give people the idea of what the problem is. Thanks. You know, that's, that's an argument that's put forward a lot. Nuclear weapons have helped to prevent large-scale non-nuclear war. Um, they've kept us from having a, a third world war in Europe since the end of the Second World War. Um, I think if you look at this closely, they don't do that, very, they don't play very much of a role in deterring conflict. Um, the United States has been involved in many, many wars since the beginning of the nuclear, war, nuclear era, as has Russia, uh, as has China. Um, we've all gone to war uh, many times. Um, they might play, the, the, the fact that nuclear weapons might get involved might play something of a role in, in cooling people down a little bit. The problem on relying on them is that if that deterrence, this is what the, the, the phenomenon is referred to as, if that deterrence fails once, it's the end of human civilization. Uh, and we know how close it has come to failing on many, many, many occasions. People like Robert McNamara, you know, concluded at the end of his life that we survived the Cuban Missile Crisis only by good luck. That was actually the, the exact same phrase that, that uh, uh, William Perry used at, at the meeting I was at on Saturday. Um, Lee Butler, who's the commander of US Strategic Forces in the 1990s, says it is either great good luck or an act of God, he's not sure which, that kept us from, ha from having a nuclear war. It wasn't deterrence. Over and over and over again, we stumbled around the brink and miraculously didn't fall over. It's just way too dangerous a strategy. Um, but that argument that you put forward has great currency, and, and, and a lot of people you know, support the continued existence of nuclear weapons because of that. Part of the message we have to bring to people is how close we have come on how many occasions and how fragile a de uh, an, an effect of deterrence is if it exists at all. It does nothing to protect us against accidental nuclear war or terrorist-provoked nuclear war, and it may not do anything uh, under the wrong circumstances to protect us from an intentional use of nuclear weapons. Well, it seems that um, governments could be persuaded or dissuaded from using weapons by international, international um, influences. What about a state like IS, which, um, because it's suicidal, which uses suicide basically as a policy, or seems to? Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, I think it's, it's critical that we deny ISIS and al-Qaeda access to nuclear materials. Uh, the best way to do that is to get rid of as much of the stuff as quickly as we possibly can. The, the, the main danger of their getting a nuclear weapon comes from the continued existence of the Pakistani arsenal, continued existence of the Russian arsenal, both of which have major security concerns, especially the Pakistani, and the continued existence of enormous quantities of fissile material, highly enriched uranium and plutonium all around the world, which they could potentially get their hands on. Um, so uh, you're absolutely right. It's critically important to make sure that they do not get their hands on nuclear weapons or nuclear uh, weapons grade material. So I just want to say one thing in closing, because we, we should wrap this up. Well, two things. First of all, to draw your attention to some websites, uh, PSR, IPPW, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Uh, there's much more information available on all of these. Uh, I actually like the ICANN website best at the moment. It's very accessible. It has terrific resources on it. Secondly, I just want to say this. Um, when you leave here today, uh, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to start forgetting the things that I've said. And as I suggested before, it's not just the usual process of forgetting. There's an active erasure that goes on. What I have told you about today is incredibly unpleasant stuff. And we don't like thinking about this. Uh, it makes us uncomfortable, and we try to get rid of it. It's very understandable. Please, though, do not let this happen. You have to hold on to this information. And you have to hold on to it in the part of your brain that motivates behavior. You know, Bar Barack Obama knows most of the stuff that I said. He doesn't know about limited nuclear war, but he knows most of this stuff. But he's got it cordoned off in some part of his brain that doesn't influence his behavior. So he gets to put forward this insane trillion dollar modernization program. You got to hold it in the part of your brain that affects your action. And every morning you have to wake up and say, amongst all the many other things I have to do today, I have to do something to make the world safer from nuclear war. You don't have to become a full-time activist. I, I, I work full-time as a doctor. I have a full-time medical practice. I could not work on this issue all the time. It would drive me crazy. I need something else in my life. But I make some room in my life to work on this issue. And each of you has to do that. You have to figure out how on this campus to bring together other Dartmouth students in the greater community here, how to mobilize civic groups like Rotary, which by the way, I'm wearing my Rotary pin today. Rotary, biggest, if any of you are Rotarians, it's the biggest NGO in the world, and it is considering taking up the issue of nuclear war prevention. Um, if you belong to church groups, you have to mobilize your church group locally and the national denomination if you belong to a church. And figure out what connections you have, how you can get this information up, how you can share some of the, the, you know, the videos that are available online with your circle of friends, put them on your Facebook page, tweet out the connections to them. You know, all the things that we do to mobilize our friends and our neighbors and our, and our potential allies in this struggle and, and make sure that this becomes a part of your life. So again, thank you very much for your coming today, listening to this stuff, and especially thank you for the things you're going to do going forward. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Just two quick logistical announcements. First, we want to thank Dr. Helfan for taking time out of his busy schedule to come. We also want to thank the Ethics Institute for sponsoring this lecture. And we also want to thank all of you guys for coming out and hearing what Ira had to say. <laughs>